President Tsai Ing-wen comes out for lowering the voting age to 18, just weeks out from a public vote on the issue. Taiwan pledges an additional 56 million U.S. dollars to help Ukraine. China's economic woes are deepening. Could Xi Jinping's politics be the problem? And once hunted, now cherished for their beauty. We take you to the southernmost tip of Taiwan to see a rare group of visitors. A warm welcome to Taiwan Plus News. I'm Leslie Liao. If you're an 18-year-old in Taiwan, you can get married, stand trial as an adult, and be called up to serve in the military. But you can't vote. But that could change soon. Next month, lowering the voting age from 20 to 18 will be put to a public vote. And President Tsai Ing-wen has come out to back the change, as Rick Glauert now reports. Youth representatives from the ruling party campaigning to lower the voting age in Taiwan get a boost from the country's president. In a referendum just weeks away, Taiwan will decide whether to change its constitution and give 18-year-olds the right to vote. Taiwan is often heralded as the freest democracy in Asia, but it has one of the world's highest voting ages. Citizens must be at least 20 years old to elect representatives to public office. Though, since 2017, 18-year-olds have been allowed to vote in referendums. In a country where political issues have long been divided along party lines, lowering the voting age has rare bipartisan support. The main opposition party, the Kuomintang or KMT, issuing a similar call to the president. It is now a numbers game to reach the threshold for the referendum to pass. Constitutional amendments by referendum require 50% of the electorate to vote in favour of the change. A recent poll shows only 46% of voters are in favour. The government has even put up videos on social media to sway voters to support the change. Ultimately, whether Taiwan's youth are given the opportunity to have a greater political voice will rely on the support of their elders, who already have full voting rights. Ricky and Rick Lowert for Taiwan Plus. Taiwan's Epidemic Response Task Force said on Thursday it may shorten quarantine requirements for COVID-19 patients. The comment comes amid concern that people isolating with the coronavirus would be unable to vote. Authorities earlier said Taiwan's election laws do not allow special arrangements for people in quarantine to vote, such as voting by mail or at designated times or places. People who test positive for the coronavirus in Taiwan are required to isolate for seven days. Because of these rules, politicians and civil society groups have warned that hundreds of thousands of people could miss out on voting. Local elections and a referendum on lowering the voting age are scheduled for November 26. Taiwan has pledged an additional aid package worth 56 million U.S. dollars to Ukraine. It was announced at a friendship reception for Ukraine in Taipei. Bing Wang was there. Here at the Taipei Guest House, the Taiwan Foreign Ministry is hosting a friendship reception for Ukrainian lawmakers. The two countries have grown closer ever since the Russian invasion of Ukraine earlier this year. Taiwanese people have turned out in large numbers to support Ukraine in their war with Russia. And the government here added its voice to the global condemnation of Moscow. The Taiwanese people raised nearly 33 million U.S. dollars for Ukraine relief efforts. And at the reception, Foreign Minister Joseph Wu made another pledge. That the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has already come up with a budget approved by our cabinet at amount of around 56 million U.S. dollars. It's going to be used to continue to provide support to Ukraine. 
While Taiwan has provided material assistance, Ukrainian lawmaker Kira Rudik says her country also appreciates the moral support. Well, I would like to start with the huge gratefulness and love from people of Ukraine. It is so amazing that people literally from the other side of the world feel your pain and feel your fight and feel your struggle and support you with that. We do appreciate it and we will never forget this. Her sentiments were echoed by other Ukrainian officials. Taiwanese people are our spiritual brothers and sisters and we are really very thankful to your people for helping us because um, we really uh, feel this support. Hopko also said Taiwan can learn from Ukraine in case of an attack by China. And for Taiwanese friends, I would say you have to learn from Ukraine how to build territorial defense system when everyone knows how to defend. Also how to counter Russian disinformation, not to allow Russian to use toxic propaganda. Much like Ukraine, Taiwan has its own much larger and aggressive neighbor on its own, intent on destroying its way of life. And through this reception, they hope to build stronger and longer lasting ties with Ukraine. James Rayner and Bing Wong in Taipei for Taiwan Plus. A mud volcano in southern Taiwan's Pingtung County has erupted, destroying fields of red beans that were just weeks from harvest. It's the third eruption this year. This time, the mud has not only buried crops, but has devastated the soil quality due to its sulfur content. <laughs> Chinese state-owned banks have intervened to support the renminbi, according to Reuters, as the Chinese currency hovers near a 15-year low against the U.S. dollar. It's the latest sign of economic strain in China after the recently concluded Chinese Communist Party Congress. But as James Chater reports, concerns over China's currency are just the tip of the iceberg. This is the moment Chinese President Xi Jinping unveiled the new seven-member Politburo Standing Committee, the Communist Party's top political body. And it's stacked with men loyal to Xi. But in the days since, tens of billions of US dollars have been wiped from the value of Chinese stocks. And China's currency has fallen to a 15-year low against the US dollar. Fueling that volatility, a fear that in Xi's China, political dogma now trumps economic sense. So with this um, new Politburo Standing Committee, it's all Xi, Xi and Xi, right? So the push of politics above economics, that's, that's Xi. The emphasis on security and stability and struggle was far more prominent than uh, economic development. The shift in focus is a big one, as analysts say it upends a decades-old understanding of China that leaders were guided by economic growth at all costs. A sign of the new times, Xi doubling down on COVID zero policies that are currently crippling the country's economy. Now we are a lot more pessimistic because of the inherent and obvious conflict between the objectives. Uh, so something has got to give between the, the security objective uh, and the growth objective. Recent economic instability comes on top of sweeping U.S. export controls to China on semiconductors, the backbone of modern devices. The controls are aimed at stopping China from becoming self-sufficient in the critical technology. But far from stemming the tide of economic decoupling, China's new leadership, mostly Xi's acolytes, appears to be doing the opposite. We see fewer uh, like foreign companies trying to enter the Chinese market to uh, uh, produce or build their supply chain because um, the uncertainty is simply um, quite big. So um, this divergence is definitely happening. And analysts say the greater focus at home on political ideology and less interaction with the outside world does not bode well for issues sensitive to Beijing like Taiwan, a democratic country which China claims as its own and is threatened to take by force. That, I think, throws the doors wide open to a lot of risk, a lot of potential for um, an outward show of um, nationalism and strength that can get out of control. China is already the world's second largest economy and is the main trading partner of many countries. The fear now? 
Xi's domestic demotion of economics below politics will have repercussions well beyond China's borders. Alex Chen and James Chater for Taiwan Plus. Russian President Vladimir Putin has overseen the country's first nuclear drills since the war in Ukraine began. The exercises involved missiles, submarines and warplanes and were intended to simulate a nuclear strike by Russia in retaliation for a nuclear attack on the country. The drills come amid Russia's claim that Ukraine is preparing to use a dirty bomb, a bomb that contains radioactive material, in a false flag attack to blame Russia. NATO has also been holding nuclear exercises. The U.S., Japan and South Korea are warning of a decisive response if North Korea conducts a nuclear test. The trio of vice foreign ministers say they are bolstering their defense cooperation to deter the growing possibility of Pyongyang using nuclear weapons. North Korea hasn't tested a nuclear weapon since 2017, but there are concerns it could soon start them again. United States FBI agents on Tuesday arrested a federal employee for lying about working for Taiwan's Navy. 57-year-old Philip Chu worked for the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. He is charged with making false statements about his contacts with the Taiwan Navy and for falsifying documents and concealing that he still holds Taiwan's citizenship. He reportedly also secretly returned to Taiwan during the height of the pandemic while pretending to work remotely in America. If convicted, Chu faces up to 20 years in federal prison. His lawyer says he is innocent. Taiwan Plus reached out to the Ministry of National Defense, who said they will not comment. October is one of the best times in Taiwan for bird watchers. That's when many migratory birds set out on their autumn migration. More than 240,000 Chinese sparrowhawks and gray-faced buzzards have been spotted on the country's southernmost tip this year. Taiwan Plus sent a film crew to Hengcun Peninsula to catch them in action. Soaring the skies before dawn, a rare group of visitors flies high above Lida Township in southern Taiwan's Pingdong County, much to the delight of the bird watchers below. <laughs> The birds are mostly Chinese sparrow hawks and gray-faced buzzards. Every year in September and October, they migrate from northeastern Asia to warmer areas like the Philippines and Indonesia. Taiwan lies right on one of their major migratory routes. So for hundreds of thousands of birds, Manzhou Township at the southern tip of the island is the last pit stop before they make the difficult ocean crossing. These days, bird watching is a big business, but not so long ago, locals used to consider the birds as a source of food or extra income. The hunters sold their catch to people with a taste for rare delicacies and to collectors who turned them into taxidermy specimens. Conservationist Tsai Yirong has been researching the migratory raptors for more than 30 years. He says there's a good reason why humans should protect the birds. Over the past two decades, local authorities have launched a number of programs to protect the birds. They're not only teaching people about the important role that raptors play in the ecosystem, they're also imposing heavy fines on people who hunt them. And some local residents have even discovered that there are ways to make money without killing the birds.
反而会带来更多的商机。And the trend of birding is catching on in Taiwan. Some enthusiasts are even sharing the hobby with their children. This is a very beautiful phenomenon. I want to share it every year. Because I want to share this beautiful phenomenon with them. If the nature is better, then we will find out that all the things are more beautiful. But if the nature is bad, we can't see the birds anymore. After dodging hunters for generations, raptors passing through the southern tip of Taiwan can finally rest safely in the local forests before testing the winds and finding the perfect current that will propel them across the ocean. Kama Xu, Alex Chen, Pi Chi Zhuang, and Andrew Ryan for Taiwan Plus. The Taipei Zoo has placed 18-year-old panda Tuan Tuan in palliative care as his condition worsens. MRI scans show that lesions in his brain have expanded, which indicates a higher chance of a malignant brain tumor. The lesions were first discovered in August, and Tuan Tuan received treatment for them then. He appeared to be improving, but his condition deteriorated earlier this month. Taipei Zhu says an invasive biopsy would be needed to find the exact cause of his illness, but they can't do that because such a procedure has because Tuan Tuan has adverse reactions to anesthesia. Tuan Tuan is getting medication to ease his symptoms, and caretakers are giving him more of his favorite food to boost his appetite. The U.S. military successfully tested components of experimental hypersonic weapons in a rocket launch on Wednesday. The Pentagon says the Army and Navy tests are part of efforts to develop a new class of weapons. Military officials say communications and navigation equipment were aboard the rocket to see if the technology could withstand the heat involved. Hypersonic missiles can travel at speeds of more than five times the speed of sound. So far, only the U.S., Russia, and China claim to possess the capability. U.S. car maker Tesla has been under criminal investigation since last year over claims that their electric vehicles can drive autonomously. That's according to a report by Reuters released on Thursday. The U.S. Department of Justice is investigating the company after reports of more than a dozen crashes, some of them fatal, involving Tesla's driver assistance system called Autopilot. In 2016, CEO Elon Musk described the autopilot system as, quote, probably better than a human driver. Just last week, he said Tesla would soon release an updated version of the driving software that he described as fully automatic. The investigation by U.S. safety officials covers over 830,000 Teslas with autopilot. The island of Xiaoliuqiu is facing an influx of tourists as Taiwan transitions to a living with COVID strategy. And while more visitors may be good for business, it's not so good for marine life. To help solve the problem, Pingdong County is considering charging tourists to visit to a fee to visit some areas. John Van Trieste has the story. Marine life like this sea turtle is a big draw on the tiny coral island of Xiaoliuqiu, just off southern Taiwan. Every day, boatloads of visitors cross to the island, a sign of domestic tourism's post-pandemic recovery. But there are also visible signs of tourism's toll on the very ocean life people come to see. This is prompting Pingdong County, which governs the island, to consider imposing a tourism fee of around two U.S. dollars for two popular island spots where visitors can watch life in the intertidal zone. But it's an idea that seems popular among locals and visitors alike. Whether a fee is eventually imposed or not, the county's goal is to make sure the island's tourism industry can thrive without hurting the coral, fish, and turtles that keep it going. Andy Xue and John Van Trieste for Taiwan Plus. The Jinmen Bridge will finally open to traffic on October 30th, a decade after the project began. The 5.4-kilometer-long project is the country's longest cross-sea bridge. It connects the outlying islands of Jinmen and Lieyu just off the coast of mainland China. Construction began in 2012 but ran into several delays. Authorities carried out inspections on Monday with some final adjustments for the bridge to open expected to be completed by Friday. Taiwan's culture minister Li Yongde has paid tribute to artist Chen Zifu, 
who has died at the age of 96 and says he will seek a presidential commendation for him. Chen is considered one of Taiwan's national treasures. He painted over 5,000 movie posters by hand. He won a Lifetime Achievement Award at the 2006 Golden Horse Awards, the Oscars of Chinese language cinema. The culture minister says Chen was instrumental in the promotion of Taiwanese films. To learn more about the legacy of Chen Zifu, Taiwan Plus reporter Bing Wang spoke to Lawrence Yang, a film scholar from National Yangming Jiao Tong University. How did he become known as Taiwan, one of Taiwan's national heroes? But I think uh, the fact that he was one of the very few painters for film posters uh, also had to do with the fact that he that his posters or film posters also uh, witnessed uh, the rise and fall of a very particular handicraft that was uh, no longer, uh, well, uh, some people would say uh, no longer being followed or no, no longer um, being um, practiced uh, nowadays. So it can became it, uh, that particular art of uh, film poster painting uh, and production uh, went from uh, sort, of, sort of commercial uh, uses to uh, a status, a kind of a particular distinctive cultural status of being a collective part of the archive of collective memory of Taiwan. So what kind of legacy did he leave behind? Um, did he inspire other artists as well? One is uh, the so-called Tai Yu Pian, or uh, also known as the Taiwanese dialect film. Uh, and the other is the Taiwanese, Taiwan-made martial arts genre. And Chen Zhifu's whole career uh, covered these two major popular film genre in Taiwan. So one, uh, so, as some scholars uh, already uh, pointed out, uh, Chen Zhifu's uh, legacy and has to do with he, his art is not just the outside or the supplement to the official film and media history of Taiwan. To some degree, in the case of uh, Tai Yupian or in the case of Taiwanese film, dialect film, uh, because so few, there are few that uh, Tao Yupian still uh, extend uh, compared to the thousand of uh, production during the period of time. So a lot of these Tao Yupian could no longer be seen except for Chen Zhifu's art that testify their existence. A youth correctional facility in northern Taiwan has teamed up with the country's world-renowned Cloud Gate Theater troupe to help rehabilitate students through the medium of dance. This might look like an ordinary school performance, but there's more here than meets the eye. This is Dunpin High School in northern Taiwan's Taoyuan City. It's no ordinary high school. It's a place where teens who have had run-ins with the law can see to their education while they undergo rehabilitation. Dunpin teamed up with Taiwan's world-renowned Cloud Gate Dance Theater to put on classes for its students. It might seem like an unconventional marriage between rehabilitation and the arts, but the teaching centers on important life skills for any teen, like focus, teamwork, and confidence. It's not just students that are getting something out of this performance. Faculty and family have also been impressed. Encounters with the law can cause rifts between teens and their parents. But for these students, dance may have given those relationships some steps to a better future. An elementary school in Taipei is opening a museum on its grounds to house a famous work by a groundbreaking former student. Yu Jinghuang has the story. Taiping Elementary School has owned this sculpture for over a hundred years. It was carved by Huang Tushui, the first Taiwanese student to study art in Tokyo when Taiwan was ruled by Japan. Huang gave the sculpture, called Hisako, or a young girl, to his former elementary school in 1920. He hoped it would inspire other children like him. Now, a century later, the sculpture is getting its own museum. Three entrepreneurs, 
who are former students, have given money to the school to house the work. And the sculpture is not the only piece that will go on display. A team from the National Culture and Arts Foundation has begun to sort out Taiping Elementary School's whole collection. They are also curating the school's grounds, indoors and out. The campus museum represents a milestone in preserving cultural heritage, offering a connection to history that goes beyond placing the work in an art museum. The school expects to open up to visitors from the second half of 2023. Klai Wang and Eugene Huang for Taiwan Plus. Thank you for watching Taiwan Plus News. Remember to download the Taiwan Plus app for more stories from Taiwan and around the world. Finally today, we leave you with images from the annual high heel race in Washington, D.C. Participants wore heels and colorful costumes to celebrate the festive atmosphere in the lead up to Halloween. I'm Leslie Liao. Take care and see you next time.